Good afternoon. I'm Dido Milne, the Director of CSK Architects. Welcome to the Building Stories Talk. This is a new series where we celebrate RIBA award-winning buildings and invite the architects to share their experiences. We can all learn from seeing the innovation, careful thought and hard work that goes into these projects, whatever their scale. Today, we are joined by the architect, engineer and client, which is great because this project really is a testament to what close collaboration can achieve. So please give a warm welcome to Mike Tonkin of Tonkin Lou Architects, who, along with Mervyn Rodriguez, structural engineer, and Dennis Peterson, the client, will be telling us their story behind this extraordinary oh. project. And please do send in any questions you have later for the Q&A. The Water Tower demonstrates how buildings can be saved and enlivened through expert retrofitting, high quality craftsmanship, and faultless attention to detail. That's a quote from Marco Goldschmidt, founder of the Stephen Lawrence Prize. So with no further ado, let's see how this extraordinary retrofit was conceived and executed. How exactly do you convert a dilapidated water tower into a 21st century home using an economy of means? We'll start to go with the client and then Mike and Mervyn will pick up the story. So Dennis, over to you. Hello. So yes, here we are looking for a bolt hole as a family project. Uh, this came up at an auction and um, has plenty of bolts. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, the family were involved. Um, this is what our children call the zombie safe house. And that's our Wi-Fi um, connection, zombie safe house. Uh, it does look a little bit daunting and we really didn't know what was at the top and there's this 10 foot fence on the outside and we couldn't get in so we were taking a risk and if you don't take a risk nothing happens so this is what we bought next slide ah so this is the tank at the top and is now our living room plenty of bolts lots of scrap metal um, all reusable of course uh, a ladder that we've reused and a water filter um, that has big holes. Um, yeah, moving on. Ah, uh, yes, this is me thinking about what I'm going to do with this. Hmm. I need an architect. Uh, luckily, our children went to the same school as Mike Tonkin and Anna Lou's son, Tynan. And, um, so this is how we had our introduction. And so I'm going to pass this over to Mike. Um, over to you, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Um, so we're going to, uh, uh, Mervyn and I are going to kind of run you through um, uh, the project. Uh, but first of all, just to say a little bit about Tonkin Liu. So we use a kind of nature-focused storytelling methodology. Um, and that helps us make each project really unique to, to the circumstances of a, a natural situation, the people in the project and the place. Um, and our, our overall aim is, as architects, is always to bring people closer to nature. And we use this method for every single project we do, and we try and make them all as distinctly different from one another as we can. Um, so this is Castle Acre. So I'm going to tell you a bit about the place now. So Castle Acre has four ruins. So one is a Norman castle, um, uh, one is a, a Cistercian priory, um, one is a bailey gate that was around a walled town, and the last one is a water tower. And those, those four ruins, the Norman castle is actually one of the best in the whole country. Um, the priory is actually really beautiful as well, full of, uh, as you would expect, expanses of sort of blank wall and kind of random windows. Um, it also has a really beautiful prior's chamber that had a window that faced north. Um, that was important for us too. Um, and um, it, it had a few staircases that are all comp compression spirals. And we learned something from that as a situation too. And the staircases are also in these towers. It's the Bailey Gate. Um, and the thing about the water tower that was really remarkable was Dennis has shown you the structure already, but it was in the middle of this beautiful barley field. So I'm going to now sort of tell you the story of the building as a series of parts. So first of all, I'm going to tell you the story of the tank at the top, and I'm going to tell you about the frame, and I'm going to tell you about the bridge, and then I'm going to tell you about the stair. 
And our idea is that each one of those sets up a different relationship with nature. Um, and each one has a very distinct spatial characteristic to it. And you get a very different experience from it. And when they're all joined together, you get this kind of holistic journey, which uh, Dennis is going to take you on um, at the end. So, so let's start at the beginning um, by looking at the tank in the opposite way Dennis is going to give us a tour. But the tank, in a way, was the important space, I think, as Dennis sort of pointed out at the beginning. Um, it's basically made uh, of panels that are joined together by bolts. Um, and being in, the, in the, the tank itself was actually quite a beautiful experience with a sort of top light coming in. And that was obviously always full of water, and water is obviously always flat. And a water tower is obviously at the top of a hill, and at the top of a hill you have a fantastic horizon. So we put across that idea of the water, the flatness, and the horizon, uh, and said, well, really what you want to do in this tank is see the horizon in every uh, from every every direction. So um, we decided that you shouldn't put just a great big hole in one side like a lot of water towers do. We should make a kind of a 360 degree view that goes all the way around. But to achieve this wasn't very easy. And that's where Mervyn comes in. Right. So uh, the challenge for us is to how, how do we take the roof of the water tower, <clears throat> which was um, the debt self weight was about seven and a half tons, uh, plus the perimeter walls, say another two and a half tons, so 10 tons. And then the imposed load of people, for solar panels, roof terraces, another 15 tons. How do we get that to, to be supported? on 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 a, a ribbon of glass supposedly and <clears throat> the way we, we achieve this is to actually use the water uh, the panels themselves uh, to create a truss in 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 their own plane and what you can see here uh, with the blue lines is how i've converted uh, flat panels by bolting angles to the, the top and the bottom and verticals and bolt in the panels together to create a, a, a truss, uh, which then spans, um, um, uh, which then spans from a box frame. And I'll speak to that back in a minute. Onto uh, onto another onto another truss. So at side elevations, the, uh, the side elevations span onto the end elevations, which you can see on your left hand side, which then are supported on four box frames, and the and the four box frames <coughs> are are. Um, 70 mil uh, rectangular hollow sections uh, which are welded together to make a really stiff frame and it's this really stiff frame that gives us not only the vertical capacity to carry 22 tons 20 almost 30 tons but also gives us lateral stability as well in the plane of the box frame and that's what allowed us to then cut away a complete ribbon of panels around the perimeter to create the uh, the glazed uh, uh, um, the glazing around the perimeter, and you can see here the box frame, and and just simple angles bolted to the uh, bo uh, to the uh, um, the wrought iron panels to create a, a truss, and so we used uh, the existing materials compositely with new materials to create uh, something that would span and and has a huge capacity. I'm sure Dennis will tell us later, but um, this so this is the structural solution intact, and from then on. The panels had to be removed. So I think that's Harry there. Um, so Dennis and Harry knocked these panels out one by one with a sledgehammer. Um, and um, I'm sure he'll tell you that was a very satisfying moment when they got them all out. So here you can see the box frame windows at the end there. They're the sort of square sections um, slightly disguised by the scaffolding pole. So you can see when people moved, walked into this, um, it almost felt miraculous, like what on earth is holding the top of that up? Um, and it still feels a little bit like that. So there are standard Velfac windows um, that, that gave us the opening area we needed. Um, and there it is, it's now Dennis's living room, which gives you that sort of 360 degree, well, not quite 360 degree, but it gives you a kind of panoramic view of, of the flat landscape that you're looking out onto. And on the roof, um, uh, Dennis wanted to have a kind of area where you could sleep. So sleeping up here, you were open to the sky. So, so um, and because you're at the top of a hill in, in the middle of nowhere, there's no light pollution. Um, it, the skies are really, really beautiful. Um, you see the constellations kind of immaculately well here. Um, so you're up in, up in the clouds, literally. And that, that's one thing about the project is that, you know, each space is trying to kind of bring you closer to the weather and, uh, and to the climate. And this is the skylight you're looking at here that goes up um, through the thickness of the roof section and it has mirrors on all sides and a light around the top. Um, and this is a film Dennis made 
of the clouds passing over the top of it. So what that also does, because the skylight's flat, when water lands on it, that water then gets blown in the breeze and the light comes through that water. So inside you get very, very interesting light effects um, and sort of uh, with the ripples and with the reflections in the room. And what it, wherever the sun is, the sun is always inside the space. And what this did for us for skylight by sort of doubling and tripling the light levels is it meant that the panels at the top of the tank that would be in silhouette and actually have light on them so that you we're balancing the light on the inside with the light on the outside so we don't have so much glare so so you get a view like this where you're seeing the inside and the outside uh, as a human eye does um, very well but the other thing it does is this is a sort of picture from the morning um in the morning um another thing about the horizon is obviously that's where the sun rises so when we stayed there we got up at dawn uh, this is just slightly before dawn the light levels sort of come up and um and then when the sun comes up um everything changes and all the condensation was on the outside is kind of burnt away and then you start to see the view um of uh, as the sun kind of rises above the land as the earth spins um and, and rises the sun into the sky so then next we'll just talk about the frame so the frame I wanted to be a completely different experience again um so the frame is a very spindly um delicate structure the columns are quite small um carrying I, I, a huge weight. and they're carrying a massive weight the weight of the tank was equivalent to eight, eight, 18 tons so yeah an eight-story building yes. was basically being yeah. held up yeah. by yeah. these four small columns which are about 220 by 150 something like that yeah. Yeah. um and uh, a little bit rusty but not a problem structurally yeah. intact yeah. um but it needs to be fireproof so they were fireproof but the nice thing about the frame is actually it looks out over this barley field so we wanted this frame to um, um, look over this barley field and enjoy that. And just like the prior's um, chamber looked north, so these rooms looked north too. And by doing that, as they looked away from the village, gave no light pollution, gave privacy to Dennis and his family in the tower, um, because the, and they looked out through these trees. So sometimes they're hidden by the trees, and sometimes they're looking at the trees. And in a way, this is all about them kind of seeing the weather change across that field. And the seasons are mo the most marked by the changes in that field. Um, so the, the frame itself then, we had to take off one side of the frame, which was embraced by the, the scaffolding, uh, to be able to get the CLT in. And then the CLT actually starts to brace the frame. So Yes, and, that, and, and, that, and initially the water tank is a large lump sitting on four columns. That then got converted into... Uh, a, a tank which is largely empty so no weight and uh infilled with uh with um with structure and and, and rooms and we use the uh, cross land timber to work compositely with the with the cross bracing in the tower to, to uh to stiffen up the, uh, the the tower itself because of the increased wind elevation so that was really important to use the cross laminate timber and it was a noticeable difference in terms of the increase in stiffness and then when you come to the inside, then all of that CLT is exposed and it's on the ceilings as well as the walls. Um, here we're in the downstairs space that has a little kitchenette. It's a kind of garden room and kind of ping pong room. And it looks out over the barley field there. Um, and uh, in, in, in above it in plan are the bedrooms. So um, they're obviously a square and each one has a bathroom in it, uh, a bed space and then a mezzanine above the bath the bathroom and the storage area so they're not huge rooms but the volume is very tall and you're looking out over this massive um clear sky in in front of a field um so there's a window on each side um and those windows give you high level ventilation and low level ventilation uh, this is a one of the original ladders that's been reused by dennis here with some plywood steps put onto it to take you up to the mezzanine where the kind of kids sleep um, and they have a bathroom, each one has a bathroom and that's tucked behind. Um, and Dennis did the uh, uh, fiberglass finish to these like he has in his own flat. And each one is a slightly different color. So kind of, you know where you are. Um, and that's tucked there, where those bathrooms are tucked in underneath that mezzanine. And that window on the side there, in this case, one of the high level ones facing east. And, um, and then the lower ones facing west. Um, and then when, when the sun rises, the, shad uh, the light shadow is, is cast from one side of it to the other. Um, and then on the outside is the sort of, uh, is, is a sort of uh, galvanized metal finish. 
Um, and that, that on the, on the uh, right there is a uh, Boston Ivy that's been planted, planted around the tower. So eventually the tower is going to be kind of, kind of covered in red ivy in the autumn. So there are the rooms that are kind of uh, timber chambers almost, but look out over this straw colored, barley colored field. Um, um, and there, there you're seeing the roof plan together. So, and the next space is the bridge. So the bridge joins those chambers with the staircase. Um, and the bridge, like the skylight, was another place where you kind of connect to nature again, but in a slightly different way. Um, this way, you're really, you look sideways and you're really looking into the trees, and the light comes through the trees, and the sunrise and the sunset are east and west on this axis. Um, and so it, it's joining the stair tower, which is a f fundamentally very blank, with the chambers, which are looking to the north. So that's the combination of the, 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 the when you're in the uh, bridge, it feels quite vertiginous because you're just sort of floating in space, but structurally that had quite an interesting role too. Yes. So we had to use the bridge to connect the two structures together to uh, allow relative movement between the two, but also to provide uh, stability between the two to share the, the wind load. Um, and that was quite a, a, a task using a cross laminated timber floor, which then supported the glass uh, um, facade and roof. And you'll, you'll see that the entrance into the stairs, too, are also full height. And that was about letting the, the full amount of the air flow into it. I will explain that later. Um, and again, the sort of the seasons are, are sort of marked as you're coming up through this. You're very much kind of in the air and sometimes in the trees and sometimes in the blossom. So very dependent on, on what, what's around you. And in terms of where we cut into the, uh, the frame, we had to then put these K braces in. That's right. So we had to we had to take the cross bracing out and then put K bracing in. And uh, and the K bracing, uh, uh, what I calculated uh, subsequently was uh, really to stop the columns from buckling, not to uh, um, provide stiffness to this to the structure. That was provided by the cross laminated timber, and that was the great surprise that the cross laminated timber was about ten times the stiffness of the uh, of of the bracing. So that really enhanced the, the, the stiffness of the structure. And uh, the other thing that really made the structure stiff is the staircase. So um, what's really interesting here is most people imagine you take steel and make a timber building stronger by bracing it with steel. We did exactly the opposite. We took a delicate steel building and we braced it by putting in kind of bulk timber. Um, and most of that work is done structurally by the stair. So the stair is a kind of box frame. The walls are 100 millimeters thick. I think we haven't calculated them to 80, 80 mil, 80 mil yes, but we could, 80 wasn't good enough for fire or something. Ah, so it had to be slightly more. So it had to be slightly it. more. And um, um, But it works like a compression spiral. So a compression spiral um, is, as you'd find in a kind of Wren building or a Robert Adam building, those sort of cantilevered stone stairs that come out. Um, effectively, we wanted the stair tower to be very blank. We the bridge is incredibly bright. We wanted the stair to be quite dark. We wanted you to kind of walk up the stair towards the light. Yeah. So there's a sort of each each space has a completely different kind of a relationship with nature. And here it was about kind of that vertical emphasis, but you don't really see out. You're not rewarded until you get to the top. Not the similar to the priory and the bit and the and the and the castle. Exactly, and they also work in the same way. The things that in a castle will always survive are the staircases because they're the strongest yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, and uh, as all of the shells you'll find on the beach too, it's the core of the gastropod shell that always survives because that's the strongest place. So any load that's put onto the shell of a gastropod is delivered into the central spiral yeah. and that helps the whole shell regain its strength. That's um, exactly what we did with the, um, with the timber uh, spiral staircase. So we're just <laughs> going to show you how that kind of went together as a kit. So here are the kind of drawings. Everything we do, we always do in Rhino. So we make kind of physical models and then we make Rhino models. Um, and then it's translated into kind of vector work. So we do everything in 3D in, from first principles. So what you'll see on the drawing on the right here is for little notches in the timber. And um, actually what you see is the staircase isn't made up of um, one piece of wood. Each tread is made up of two pieces. So those two pieces is what make the underside look more exaggerated, like you'd find on the bottom of a Robert Adams stair, where he exaggerates the profiling of the underside of the stair. Um, so, so that's what, how we get that sort of sculptural effect. And there you see in these 100 millimeter blocks, the little grooves. So to build it is incredibly simple. So I think Dennis will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think all of these pieces of timber to make the staircase over four floors 
cost three thousand five hundred pounds, um, and to assemble them took Ben and Nigel, I think, four days. Wow. So, so it's an incredibly cheap way of building a very sculptural yeah. stair that structurally um, um, holds the whole building together. So, um, so there you see the kind of spiral of it um, coming round, and there you see the tall opening onto the bridges. And that's because we wanted the air from the rooms to flow into the stair because we're using the stair as a thermal chimney to pull all the hot air up through the building. Um, yeah, that's Lockie up at the top there. Um, um, so the family was involved in lots of the construction uh, stages of the building, which was a really nice thing to happen. And there you're looking up through. Um, and the balusters here, uh, we put two balusters per tread, um, which didn't cost any more because these balusters actually came out of the tank the rods we showed you before that hold the tank together. Stop the bulging. Exactly, they stop the bulging of the whole tank. But then, so they're rusty, and then a steel cap was put on by one of the local craftsmen. Or oh, maybe we should have mentioned that too. Nearly, nearly this whole project is built by people who came from the village or thereabouts. And the local pub was very key in actually meeting everybody. And Dennis, if you go into the pub with Dennis, he knows everybody. So, um, <laughs> um, and as you go up the stair, you're also very aware of the texture. Um, it's it's a wire brushed finish, which is really nice because I, it doesn't give you splinters, but it does catch the light very beautifully. And then the handrail on top of the steel um, is quite forgiving. It's one of those kind of plastic handrails you had in the school staircase um, that takes you when from top to bottom. So um, it also has a lift. So when you've got heavy shopping, um, you can go all the way to the top, which is where the kitchen logically is, because that's where you want to spend most of your time. So environmentally, just mention a few things. So I mentioned about the stair tower works environmentally like the buildings in Yemen, um, the, the buildings in Shabam. They have very tall, tall you know, they're eight stories tall, and the stair tower acts like a thermal chimney, and that's what we did here. So the building stays relatively cool, and the window there is facing towards the north, so it doesn't overheat, um, it doesn't pollute the pollute the light of the village either. Um, and then the other apertures we kept as small as possible just to make the ventilation work. So um, it's all working on very passive principles. And then it has an air source heat pump. Um, and then uh, integration did the servicing for us. And um, it's all quite straightforward and has a sort of vertical service riser. Um, and it's all about kind of getting to the top and getting that view of the horizon because nobody kind of gets a view like that. And um, in, in a way, the ensemble is about um, connecting you with nature in sort of four or five different ways. And I think that's um, that's all from me and Mervyn. Dennis is now going to take us around the building um, on a tour. Excuse any wind noise. It's a pretty breezy spot, this. Um, so, yep, this is uh, our terrace, which is actually made from um, the uh, cast iron panels. So from the from the tank at the top. Uh, we Don't call it call the, the ferris, Dennis. We call it the ferris, exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take you just back a little bit. We can see where we are. I mean, you've seen this on the on the pictures already, but um, it's quite nice to do it live. You get a feeling of uh, living. Just take you in. Oh. And the buildings that we saw off the side there, that's where Dennis lived while the construction was happening. That's the equivalent of the, the, the containers of the equivalent of the caravan on site. Basically, the blank stair tower. Let's go in. Yeah. <sighs> the first thing that hits you, actually, is the smell of wood. And it's very, very homely. It just feels so, so nice to be here. Let me just take you around. We've got a mini kitchen here. Um, you know, for, for only gardening, you make yourself a cup of tea. Um, it's got a fridge, there's a washing machine in there somewhere. And downstairs, loo, which is again, um, a fiberglass fiberglass finish on the walls and uh, a bit of a wet room in case we buy a dog. I don't know about that yet. <laughs> Thinking about it. Do it, um, Danny. Get the dog. 
I don't know about dogs, Mike. <laughs> uh, here we've used a, a ladder um, to get to the service area, which is at the top uh, through a little hatch up there. Uh, and we can get to all the, uh, the the plant room where there's the boiler and other bits and pieces. A um, bit of a space for hanging. I'm going to just have to show you that. Up. Oh, there we are. This is a lovely staircase. And here, if I can catch it, are the rusty old... Oh, it won't focus. Yeah. The rusty old stair rails. Let's take us up. <clears throat> the top of the stair, the oval cutout, um, is the same shape as the void in the stair. And there's a very nice moment when the sun comes through that and it casts a shadow into the corner of the building and it makes a heart. And uh, whenever I've seen that, I've never had my camera on me. So, um, um, but uh, yeah. There's always some lovely light happening. Here's, here we're just walking into some little. So this is the bridge. Just, I mean, it's beautiful. There's always something going on in here. Uh, through the bridge into one of the bedrooms, a little desk there. Um, you can see that the cross bracing is, is uh, providing the stability in the plane where you've got the full glazed uh, facade. And that was quite a tricky thing, actually, slipping those... Um, uh, those windows up through between the gap between the cross bracing, the cross -bracing and the floor plane uh, was one of the most complicated parts of a project. And again, local local workers, the windows came from four miles away. So, um, well, the windows, the little windows you see there are actually Belfax, but we've hidden the frame by bringing uh, plywood, a plywood detail into the reveal. So. Um, you would notice the Velfac handle, but um, the Velfac window, which are great windows, but uh, a bit ubiquitous. So uh, we've hidden them. Okay. <clears throat> a quick peek into this little wet room here. Um, we've got, uh, uh, what have we got there? I can never remember. It's uh, heat ventilation, mechanical MVHR, yeah, yeah, that's the one, Mike. Thank you. Heat recovery, heat yeah. recovery, and that yeah. serves the whole building. So that basically all the hot air that ends up in the top of the tank that goes up the thermal chimney is brought back down to the bottom and fed back into the system. So, yeah, so the building uses very little energy. Um, obviously, the timber it has insulation on the outside before we're regulated. Um, it's obviously an incredibly exposed building. Um, but uh, but so far, Dennis, you've been there on the really, really hottest days and I think some of the coldest and generally it seems to be performing reasonably well, I think. It's been, yeah, I mean, do you know what? It, I mean, it shakes about in the wind, well, um, especially on those big stormy days, but it shakes about enough to, you know, not to feel comfortable, feels a little bit like you're on a boat. Well, that's 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 a, shows that the, uh, that the that the wind load is being shared by the uh, by the, the cross bracing and the uh, cross laminated timber. Both are interconnected uh, so that they work together. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a real hum from the uh, balustrade on the on the roof, and with the shake of the building. You know, it's just a little wobble. Sometimes it vibrates a little bit. It's quite nice, but it does feel like you're in some kind of Jules Verne uh, vehicle. Well, Here we are at the top. Make sure that the self weight of the balustrade in the terrace was sufficient so that it didn't blow away, because it's not actually fixed down to the uh, through the waterproofing. It just sits on top. But it's incredibly heavy. So uh, I think even in the hundred mile an hour storm. What we were more worried about it blowing away was flutter. Yes. Um, because yes, you would get a kind of you you'd get the kind of environment uh, the environmental flutter effect. And maybe Dennis, something about all the raw finishes. The raw Dennis finishes. What's the main contractor? I think maybe we haven't made that completely obvious, but um, <laughs> Dennis basically built this whole thing um, with the help of everybody in the village pub. And um, so yeah, and you know some very 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 talented. Um, uh, electrician and plumber. In fact, the electrician and plumber was the same person. 
which was great because they didn't fight. <laughs> um, and the, the, in fact, so it was Nigel and Ben. Nigel and Ben are the, the contractors uh, who did mm, probably, I would say, 75% of the work. And uh, their father this was, and son, which is also very nice. Yeah, the father and son, and this was their first project. Oh, wow. So I do like to take a risk. <laughs> uh, and you should have told me that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, should we go? I, I'm just yeah, going to take. Good. I'm probably going to run out of time in a minute, so I'm going to just take you onto the roof. Uh, you probably get a bit of wind noise from up here. There's your flat skylight and um, the heavy balustrade. Very heavy balustrade. And the solar panels are on the other side. And a, uh, there we go. And here's where you get the real freedom. You can see the village is quite close, so in a way that's why the building's oriented. The village is beautiful, but that's not what it's um, and that's why we oriented the whole building away from the village to the beauty of that barley field. So, so it feels like you're you're completely on your own when you're there. You don't really see anybody, and they don't really see you. And I think that addressed one of the concerns from the village itself that they didn't exactly. want to what light pollution. Yeah, so that was good for planning as well. I mean, I guess I should say that in planning, it had something like 25 people um, sending in letters of commendation for it and two complaints. So um, what was nice is everyone in the village really liked the fact this building was getting developed because an awful lot of them had had the right of passage of climbing this as a kid and getting to the top was seen as a sort of badge of honour. So almost everybody in the pub has already been to the top of this tower before Dennis... Um, um, started, uh, you know, bringing it back to life, basically. So it's had massive local support. And everyone's been amazing in the village. That's correct. Um, it's been really quite an amazing thing for me to do, uh, for the family, actually. We, we really do enjoy being here. Um, it's, it's, it's heaven. I, I, in fact, actually, this, this is the worst place because you come up here for breakfast and you can't get downstairs. You're just constantly looking out the window. There's no TV here. We don't need that. It's a, a proper bolt hole. And uh, yeah, you can see all the bolts. <laughs> Which are working, not just there for looks. Well, that's they're, true, they're all they're still- part of the structure. <laughs> Fascinating, fascinating. Thanks so much, um, Mike, Melvin, Dennis. It was really insightful in terms of both the design process and also um, the construction process. Um, we've had quite a few questions coming in, so um, we're going to go to those in a minute. But first, I'm going to kick off, if I can, with a question of my own, um, which is, as an architect, you tend to draw projects over and over again as part of the sort of iterative design process. And nowadays, you actually model them um, with incredibly re you know, realistic um, uh, modeling like you know we've we've seen some of the um rhino models of the stair tower and when you do this often there are very few surprises left with the actual end product um i was lucky enough to visit um the water tower as part of the jury for the stephen lawrence prize and obviously in advance of my visit i went and looked at the plans and the sections and the photographs and i thought i had a pretty good idea what this building was going to feel like spatially and so it was a great delight to actually be surprised um I was really bowled over spatially by the way the building unfolds and the landscape is revealed to you as you move through the building. It really is a building that you should visit, um, culminating the extraordinary uh, room at the top with the ribbon window. Um, so my question is uh, to you all really, um, did anything surprise you in the final finished building? Shall I go first? So from a structural point of view, um, the real surprise for me was looking at the relative stiffness of the steel bracing versus the uh, the stiffness of the cross laminate timber. And to find that the cross laminate timber, even though it was reduced when you had the entrance into the um, into the rooms, was some, something like 10 times stiffer than the uh, than, than the cross bracing itself. 
so that really enhanced the stability and the stiffness of the uh, of, of the of the structure itself and and for me the great great achievement is is finding a way of achieving achieving the ribbon of um, glass uh, and supporting this 20 to 25 tons of uh, roof structure above mike anything spatially or when when we when Dennis first showed us the water tower, I, he said, "I've got a water tower." I imagined, you know, the sort of brick Victorian thing, and then he showed me a picture of it, and I thought, like, "Whoa, that's a, that's special," you know, because it's quite brutal. It's quite a sort of brutal structure and very simple, very 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 industrial. And I think we wanted to keep that industrial aesthetic on the outside because it didn't feel like we should be trying to change the nature of it. But I think what's surprising for me is, and maybe for people who visit, is how the difference between what it looks like on the outside and how it feels on the inside. On the inside, it's very much uh, um, uh, a home and uh, it's part of the environment around it. But on the outside, it still feels like this kind of um, piece of industrial heritage. Uh, yeah, I agree of, with that. Or yeah. ruins of Castle Acre. Mm. Dennis, anything surprises for you? Yeah, I, I'm surprised it got completed. <laughs> <laughs> you yes, are very yeah. brave, Clyde. It was an incredibly brave project to take on, yes, yeah. Yeah, it's been fun. It really has been a lot of fun. And, um, yeah, I've learned a lot, and I don't think I want to learn it again. Fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Well, well, I'm going to move to a question now from Leo. Um, he's a student, I think. Um, and as students, we're taught to design the building according to the client's desires. This is one for you, Dennis. Um, I'm not sure what Dennis does professionally or what his hobbies are, but how does the water tower complement Dennis's and his partner's lifestyle or work? Ah, okay. So I'm a photographer. Um, obviously, uh, having done photography for quite a long time, I've got an eye for detail, and that detail is in, in what I do. You know, I'm kind of used to building things. My partner's, um, um, or Misha, my partner, wife, um, is a costume designer. And we, we're we into colors. We know we kind of like the same, well, we'd like the same things. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be together. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this kind of brings out the best of both, both of us. And we enjoy the garden with stuff that we, you know, just, and actually what we've really got into since being here is watching this this the moon the sun come up and go down and the birds and the, and the bees i can understand and, why you wouldn't want to leave that top space it's incredible yeah really yeah. And you think well just yeah. watching a storm come in come in from yeah. one hour oh, it's it, there's something yeah very timeless yeah. or just that. watching watching a a, a a kestrel just hover mm. in front of you is mm. really quite amazing i mean this is another question actually it sort of leads on from from camille um which is how is the surrounding nature and he wants to know about plants animals and insects um responding to the building okay well that's that is a good question um it, quite often we see a group of deer running across the field um that's normal standard and, and then there's a couple of red kites flying by today and the kestrel again this morning um but it changes so quickly because this is kind of industrialized farmland around us. Um, it can change within hours. You get a tractor on it and suddenly it's a different, completely different color within four hours work, you know? So in nature, I mean, it's, it's incredible how, how things change. Um, I wish it wasn't so industrialized around here and actually, but there you go. We're in it, uh, but we still love it. Yeah. I have an, another question. Um, this is probably for Mike and Mervyn, um, in that I felt that the building was a real triumph in terms of architect engineer collaboration. Um, the architectural expression is absolutely indivisible from the structural expression. And it offers a great purity of vision through an economy of means. And there's something, I think there's something really deeply satisfying about this, finding architectural expression out of an economy of means. Um, there seemed to me to be sort of a structural or environmental logic to almost every architectural move that had been taken. So my question is, um, how early on the design process did you uh, start collaborating? And was it a sort of a wrestling match to get to the ultimate 
the, the ultimate solution or did it naturally sort of fall out between you both? Um, well, to start with, I think we, uh, my initial, initial thoughts was to try and mimic what we had before, which is a very large weight, many tons of water sitting on four columns. And so the initial thought was to actually hang the accommodation from that water tower to, mim to bring the load back up to the top. And so it mimicked. But we, that gave us quite a few problems to do with how do we tie it? How do we, what happens when the uh, ties uh, stretch? Um, uh, and uh, with tension and and then that evolved into uh, using the cross laminated timber sitting it onto the ground and using that compositely with the existing structure to enhance the stiffness and that's how we came up with the, the, um, the sort of structural solution of sharing the the, 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 the wind load with the steel structure and the comp and, and the cross laminated timber and getting getting both to work well and together do you sort of do workshops between the two of you to sort of, you know, to wrestle out the, the problems? Or? I don't think it's just a very natural collaboration, I think. Yeah, I, think. I, think. I mean, I, I think being an architect, one of the nicest things is working with engineers. And um, well, because my, my late dad was an engineer and his dad was an engineer and his dad was an engineer and okay. our son's an engineer. So it's kind of slightly in the blood. And when you mm. work with a great engineer like Mervyn, it's so satisfying. Mm. Mm. Okay, that's... Great. And also, I'll tell you about Mervyn. The reason I found Mervyn originally, I was in someone's attic somewhere, and they showed me a column that was holding up the whole attic. It was only this big, and uh, and I said, who, "Who was your engineer?" And they said, "Oh, this guy called Mervyn Rodriguez." And I said, "I want to meet him." I want that's him. The beautiful <laughs> economy I've ever seen, and actually, that's what it's like with Mervyn. I think everything we do is incredibly cost-effective because I think we both believe in that uh, relationship between economy and delight, and that's what you find in nature. And I think when architecture and nature come together, and like all my heroes, Dieste, Nervi, Candela, Gaudi, they all make that fusion of nature and engineering and architecture together. Mm. Mm. Um, going back to some, some of the questions that have been coming in, this one's from um, Lisa. Um, such a special project. Um, what she wants to know is what was the biggest challenge of, of, of the project? Um. For me, the challenge was um, getting the ribbon of glass to work. I mean, that really was pushing the boat out. And uh, and the key to it was creating this box frame with the corners locked together, uh, really enhanced the stiffness, not only in uh, lateral stability, but also the vertical capacity of the, of, of, of the box sections, allowed us to take a huge load uh, with using very small sections. And, and that was, for me, that was the key to making the, the, the glass ribbon work. Okay. This is um, a very practical question. It's probably for you, Dennis. Um, lots of people are asking, are you going to hold another open day this summer? Ah, yes, I am. Yeah. Ah, great. Yeah. Okay. Was, there, was there like 1,000 people turned up last time, Dennis, or something crazy? Yes, I had a 1,000 visitors. The last one we didn't advertise, so we didn't uh, have that many people. But, um, yeah. 2019, we had about a thousand visitors every weekend. And Mervyn, if you checked it out for a thousand people on the roof? Um, well, I, I hope that there will be a limit to the to <laughs> less than a thousand people on the roof. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, as someone who's visited it, I strongly recommend. Uh, you know, some buildings need to be visited, and I think you know this one is is definitely definitely one of those. Um, just trying to scroll through other questions. Um, this is a question from Adam, um, for you, Mike. Um, do you need to modify your nature-led approach when working on urban projects? No, because uh, nature is also in the city. Uh, nature is rain. Uh, look at our sun rain rooms. You know, we celebrated the raindrop in our back garden here. Uh, it's for wind, it's for sun, it's light. I mean, I could concentrate on light, but actually all of the elements are beautiful. And all of those elements are what makes life special. And there is just as much in the city as they are in nature. Mm -hmm. and, and actually almost every building we do, we try to bring kind of planting into it because I'm also a landscape architect. And, um, and so I think, you know, that makes it even more special that you should be bringing nature into the heart of the city. Have you thought about growing anything up the outside of the building so to, to bed, it in, bed it in even further or, or not really? Well, it has been planted with uh, Boston Ivy, Dennis, hasn't it? About five yeah. or six plants. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just taking forever. It's such a windy spot. Okay. We had a, we had the uh, the Boston Ivy growing nicely up there, and then it all just blew off. So <laughs> <laughs> it'll get there eventually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it the longest Boston Ivy that makes it. Yes. Though, so, yes. Um, yeah. 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 Mm. Well, it'll be nice for the nesting birds if you can get some something like yeah, that. Yeah, I'd love it. Yeah, I'd love it. it, it also, it'll, it'll make it look like a ruin again, which is kind mm. of nice. Mm. Put it back where it was. Another question from Jo. Um, she wants to know, or he, uh, how wide is the largest span and was it a self-build project? Ooh, I think the largest the widest... span was the roof spanning across the roof. I think it's seven, seven meters. Because yeah. we don't span the long way, we span the short way. And I think, is it six or? Six, 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 six meters, six, six, six meters. by seven, actually, the the, uh, the tank. And we had to use uh, glue laminated timber uh, with uh, the plywood deck working compositely. So it behaved like a stressed skin roof um, with composite action between the plywood and the glue lam to make it work. And actually that was, go back to one of the questions before, what was the most challenging bit? That was one of the challenging bit. The roof had to get a little bit taller to deal with that structure. And um, and that meant the roof got a little bit taller and one of the neighbors complained it got taller. So it had to go back to planning. So um, that was that was an annoying part. So, you know, you only need one kind of fawn in the side in the village to make your life very difficult. Whereas most buildings from planning actually evolve into something slightly different when it gets built. But uh, but but in the, in this case, you know, that was an annoyance, I'd say, to the to the process, um, because you can't really generally do all of the engineering of a project before planning, because you don't want to spend all the money in case you don't get planning. Mm -hmm. And actually, as one of the attitudes of a, one of the planners was that the building should be just put to scrap metal, mm -hmm. um, go, going through and persuading the planners that actually, of course, it's part of our industrial heritage. Of course, it's part of a village. It's just as worthy to be saved as a monument as, you know, well, it's maybe not on the same league as the tower and the castle, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the, the prior in the castle, but it still has sort of historical merit yeah. for the future, mm -hmm. you know. So I think planning is is the thing that's a, a bit of a, a challenge for architects when uh, the planners only see things in very uh, retrogressive and backward looking ways. And for the other half of the question, yes, it was a self-build, but with a lot of help. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I needed the help. I couldn't do it on my own. I, I, I was doing my my job, my, job. my real job <laughs> at the same yes. time. But yeah, uh, yeah it was a yeah. self-build with help. Mm. I mean, for me, just going back to the engineering again, I think one of the very interesting things about this project, if you look at the sort of backdrop uh, that Dennis um in the moment you've got to sort of look no hands you know with this ribbon sort of but it's not structural gymnastics for gymnastics sake you're achieving incredible um thing architecturally by by having that um that ribbon glazing but then when you get into the stair tower i really like the fact that it's a very direct expression of gravity and the loads being brought down to the ground through the compression spiral and it's really direct it's very nice to see yeah see structure on display like that i suppose in such a clear clear way it makes the building very legible um we, we've got one other engineering question which from joe which is did you this might be directed to you dennis because i think you fitted out the bathrooms which was did you train in boat building to learn about fiber glass fabrication no, um, I, I got the local roofer to do that. So he worked with GRP and um, I've done, my bathroom in London is done in the same way. Um, so it's, it's fiber, it basically it's the gray fiberglass material um, with color in it. And you can get any RAL color and uh, just add that to the, uh, to the fiberglass. It also smells grey, I must say, and the detail on the door is impeccable because it's a plywood door that has one mill of fiberglass on, and on the edge you just see the coloured fiberglass meet the edge of the door, and, and Dennis has done that so beautifully. So I think only a photographer would have that level of preciseness in the detailing. And this is a sort of maybe an environmental question a little bit um, from, me, um, from Mika. Um, does Dennis live in the water tower all year round? Have you seen the seasons change there? You know, does it in terms of environmentally through the seasons? Yeah, 
I'm much. I'm here I'm here probably five days a week if you know if I can make it more then I then I will be um, it's quite difficult because I've still got my real job in London which is really annoying <laughs> <laughs> but as far as seeing the change change of seasons um, yeah it, it's really dramatic it's so much more dramatic than I ever imagined mm. Mm. Um, I'm, uh, you know, spring's happening. Firmly right comfortable, now. firmly comfortable in the in because you know the oh. walls are very thin. You know, in yeah. The, in yeah, the yeah, yeah. No, it's super warm. It's uh, very cozy, and if it gets if it gets too warm, you know, like Mike says, we've got this this uh, ventilation system that just you know open the door at the bottom of the stairs, open the window at the top, and uh, we've got this natural ventilation that just works really, really well in the heat of the summer. Um, we collect also, I forgot to mention that, is we'd, we've got a very small roof compared to the, the size of the building. So what I've done is I've, I've put a gully all the way around the outside of the building so we can collect uh, rainwater. So we've got uh, rainwater flushing toilets and um, a washing machine. So just to, just to help things along a little bit. But environmentally, it's uh, it's it's brilliantly warm it's really homely it's very woody and yeah it's it's perfect it's it's, it's a great experience just being here okay and any particular sort of planning or building control um uh, difficulties or challenges that worth sharing sort of ah uh, well the clt yes because i didn't i'm a, an ex-painter and decorator so the clt the the building control really wanted me to coat that and i kind of fought with them quite a bit and somehow I met uh, online I met a, a really uh, lovely guy who just seemed to be head of fire department in in I don't know he just did it for free he just did me a really amazing report that told building control that all I needed was a sprinkler system and so I didn't need to put anything on the wall on the wooden uh, cross laminated timber so right. there was no there was no fire coating. It's just bare, and uh, you know, as a, an ex painter and decorator, I you know that's perfect for me. I don't want to main, do any maintenance here. Well, we're running out of time now. For final question, um, which is um, from Roger: If you were to add an extension to the water tower, what would its function, material, and appearance be? Any wow. thoughts? Anyone? Oh, I would no. like a, I would like a greenhouse, but. Uh, I don't know how we're going to do that, Mike. We just put it on top. <laughs> <laughs> hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Extra yeah, window. That might blow away. That might yeah. blow away. <laughs> well, in a way, I think um, a greenhouse would be lovely. But uh, when I was a student, I did a project about a tower in the countryside, where uh, and the story was about an old man who arrived and threw seeds off the top, and the big seeds travelled a long way and became trees, and the small seeds landed close and became wildflowers. And the, the tower then became surrounded by a wood. And in some ways, this tower is a little bit like surrounded by a wood. And the idea that um, nature is, um, Dennis is doing a rewilding project, photographing a rewilding scheme very close by in West Acre. And somehow, uh, I guess, uh, I'm not sure it needs more architecture. I think it needs more nature. Yeah. And, um, yeah. If it could be rewilded and brought back to nature, it would make it more ruin like. And mm. I think it would it would give you another experience. And I think it would answer that question about the animals that, you know, already there's a little pond, but it would bring back the voles and the rabbits and the foxes and, the, you know, mm. so I think um, I wouldn't add it any more buildings. I'd, uh, yeah, bring nature, back. bring nature back, yeah. Well, great. Um, I think it's probably time that we sort of, um, like I say, a few sort of closing remarks, which is um, really thank you very much um, uh, to all three of you it's been an amazing story um and um yeah so yes thank you thank you for this um remember that uh, building stories um, will be back next week on tuesday the 29th of march same time same place um and our special guests will be david chipplefield architects and john ross and martin Nassim from 6a architects um, and they're going to share their unique stories about the royal academy of art and mk gallery followed by a live interactive Q&A session, all hosted by Tracy Meller from Roger Sturk Harbour & Partners. 
Um, both projects are gallery and cultural buildings that worked with existing buildings, which had an impressive history and legacy that needed to be um, sensitively respected. And you can sign up for tickets for this um, talk in the um, link in the chat. So yes, just thank you very much for sharing a story. Fantastic project and uh, yeah, well done everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.